You know, oftentimes I hear people talk about the church. You know, they usually have something bad to say about the church. They're critical of the church. They don't say which church. They don't say whose church or what church. They just talk about the church. And so they have something wrong about what's wrong with the church. And they always have their own way of looking at it by saying what's right with what they're saying. The interesting thing is, is that, did you know that church is what you make of it? You yourself are the church. It's not a building, it's not a structure. It's just the congregation of people assembled together. And the reason why God assembled these people together was to learn how to get along. So it's interesting to me that he went out of his way to start the church by grabbing people that didn't get along with each other. You see, he went out and he picked certain people specifically. He chose them and he called them, but God specifically anointed each one of the ones that he chose to be in the church because God knew best what we need for our life. Now, I find it interesting that you have 12 men who don't necessarily get along. You have an educated man, you have a religious man, you have a young man, you have an old man, you have a fisherman, a drunk, an alcoholic. You have people who were from different parts of the land that they didn't even like each other, much less have too much dealing with each other. You even have one of those, oh, God forbid, a child molester, I mean a tax collector. And yet, God brought them together. And as a matter of fact, he chose out of 70 people, maybe even 120, those whom he would make his church. And he even kept those 70 around. So there were lots of personality conflicts, lots of challenges that they had to learn and adapt to, even though they didn't get along with each other. And you notice that as you read the scriptures, before the Holy Spirit came upon them and gave them the ability to get out of themselves, to deny themselves, and do what Jesus said, take up the cross and follow him, that they even were so wrapped up about themselves that they wanted to put themselves in charge, some of them. Some of them wanted to lord it over each other, you know, to be the head honcho, to be the macho man, you know, to backbite and talk about, you know, the other ones, yeah, you know, that Judas, you know, or that disciple Jesus loved, you know, I mean, you see it in the scriptures, but you don't necessarily apply it to your life until you see someone talking about the church Jesus died for. Now, I find it interesting that in the letters to the seven churches, even the ones that I look at their faults and say, ooh, yick, you know, and I might have been one of those people that probably be pretty critical of those churches. And yet Jesus didn't give up on them. Kind of interesting, isn't it? In the letters to the seven churches, Jesus did not only look at it as far as being a type of age that you know they were going through, but he looked at it as being one of the churches that's around today. You know, maybe your church. You know, maybe in the letters to the seven churches, you were found in one of those. Because if you're not, you're probably not going to be saved because you're going to eventually show your true colors. And Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples indeed and that you have love for one another. Jesus said that in those days, you know, that some would disassemble themselves. Well, if they were not of us, John said, if they left us, then they were not of us from the beginning. And you kind of find it interesting is that, I don't know about you, but if I took a branch here off my tomato plant and cut it off and stuck it in the ground, it'd die. It would die because it needs the stalk, it needs the roots, it needs the soil, it needs water, it needs light, it needs sunshine, and it needs to grow. It needs to do what it was designed to do. You were designed to have fellowship one with another because Jesus said, in as much as you've done it to the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. So a demonstration lots of times of who you are in Jesus is demonstrated by how you act towards other people. If you love one another as I have loved you, then you would 
love not the world nor the things of the world, but you would what? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So he loved the people, not the things of the world. So it's not loving the world per se, but it's loving people to bring them into a place of eternity. And so if you love those that like you, if you love those that love you, Jesus said, well, that's no big deal. Love your enemies. Love those who despitefully and wrongfully use you and abuse you. Really? That don't sound right. That sounds like child abuse, or that sounds like wife abuse, or that sounds like male abuse. Kind of sounds bad to me. But you see, God can lead you and direct you. He gave after the disciples proved that none of them would follow him, but they all left him alone to die. God gave his Holy Spirit so that they would be able to do the things that Jesus said to do. Because if you try to accomplish things religiously, if you try to make yourself better or make yourself good, then the goodest you're ever going to get is pretty critical and pretty lame, actually. It may look good on the outside, but according to what God said, on the inside, there's canker worms just eating you up inside, just tearing you apart. That you just, you know, you'll look around and get so legalistic that you'll really want to start, you know, making your own rules and regulations about what people ought to do. Well, wait a minute. That is what people do when they criticize the church, don't they? They always have some rule that they want to make other people do. Funny thing is, Jesus said, listen to what they say. Always listen to what a man says. Jesus said that about the scribes, the Pharisees, the leaders, politicians, people in authority, people around you. Listen to what they say, but watch what they do. Because a lot of times what manifests itself about what a person is, isn't so much their words as their actions. How do they act? And how do they react? Because that usually can determine love because love is easy to say, I love you, and send a card. But the person who demonstrates the love of God through a lifetime of devotion and emotion carried away with that love for that person, that person blooms like these plants. They grow up into the stature that God would have them to be. They bear fruit in their life. They have peace, love. Enjoy. It is interesting that Jesus died not just for the sins of the world, but that he actually laid down his life for the church itself. So if you're finding yourself, you know, surrounded by critical people and they're always bad mouthing what you're doing at church, why not change what's happening in your church and make it something you enjoy? Why not become a part of healing? helping and not hindering the work of God in the body of believers that may be right where you're at. Because you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You can bring the good news right where you're at. Little children, abide in me. He that wavereth is like as we wait for the plane to go fly over. anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Jesus unto another gospel, which is not another. Though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Jesus has become of no effect unto you, whithersoever you are justified by the law, you were fallen from grace. You did run well, but who did hinder you? As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you, except you abide in me. If you abide 
in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God his Father. If you notice, when Jesus was alive, he said that he didn't go out and do the right thing. He didn't go out and do the wrong thing. He didn't go out and do the political thing. He didn't go out and do the expedient thing. He didn't do those things that made people happy. He didn't make and do those things that made people mad. He did those things he said he saw his father doing. Well, how could he say that and do that? Because we're also told that he got up a long time before the sun even came up. And he spent time in prayer, which he called conversation with God. You see, his father, as he described it to us, because he was alive and walking amongst us, he said his father wanted to speak to us. His father wanted to have fellowship with us. His father wanted to talk and direct us. And that if we would yield ourselves to listening and taking the time to be still and know that he is God, we could be directed by God, according to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which literally says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not in your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. Now, there may be some criteria to that, meaning like you need to listen in order to be directed. You need to ask in order to get. You need to hear in order to understand. And a lot of times people don't want to hear what God may say. I know for myself, whenever I talk to people, I ask them, well, do you really want to know? Because more often than not, people want a quick fix to the situation they're in rather than a permanent solution to the reason why they're doing what they're doing and repeating the cycle over and over and over again. I know for myself, I'm always amazed at how much I repeat my own mistakes until finally I go, now I get it. I got it. I reap what I sow. Okay, so I caused some of this to happen. Or maybe, in my case sometimes, I caused all of this to happen. And so I had to suffer the consequences of my actions. So then I decide, you know what? I don't want to do that anymore. I want to plan ahead of time and not do those actions that caused me to suffer consequence. So then God directs me in the way I should go. And somehow that works out better. And you know, when I really need some encouragement, and when I really need some help, I go to a place where I know I can receive that, and I know I can give that. And for me, I don't know about you, but it isn't just standing alone on the street corner by myself and you know acting like I'm very religious. But it's going to church and being humble enough to admit I need help and admit that I need fellowship with other people who may have gone through the same thing that I've gone through, who may be able to encourage me with their experiences like I encourage others with mine. That maybe the church that I'm so critical of, or you are, or the people that you know are critical of, are missing out on something because the person that's critical of it is the missing link that should be encouraging rather than discouraging those who are called by his name.